I'm about to tell you exactly what I mean by the dark side of poker. But before we get into that, on the bright side, Grade E of the Carrot Poker School, our mass data course that uses millions upon millions of hands garnered from low stakes games, is dropping this month, August 2023, on CarrotCorner.com. You'll be able to find out exactly how your opponents are playing every meaningful spot in the game tree. You're going to know how aggressively to bluff, how wide to call, where to fold most of your range, and much, much more. There are 10 episodes each one hour in length, and you simply are not going to believe how many amazing opportunities there are that we show you in this course to exploit the population and play in a really unbalanced way to devastating effect. Grady of the Carrot Poker School is the final piece of the poker puzzle if you've taken our theoretical content. This is a must watch. It's amazing how looking at imbalances in your opponent's game can add a ton of money to your bottom line, to your EV and your win rate. I hope you enjoy it. I'm super excited about it dropping. Stay tuned for further announcements. Now let's move on to a more gloomy subject and discuss the dark side of this wonderful game. I love it when students come to me with really winning graphs over big samples because they've put in the work and they are winning players. They've moved up several stakes and they are just printing a bunch of money. It's the best feeling as a coach. There's just no beating it at all. But when you look into those graphs, those success stories a little bit more closely, what you actually see is that there were periods where things were just really bleak and grim for a while, where the poker player just had to survive an onslaught of annoying variants. I just played a session here, which is part of my 100 NL GG Poker Bankroll Challenge. We've kicked it off at 100 Russian cash, and we're going to be gradually, over the next year or two, producing content in this series for CarrotCorner.com for the subscription service that we're launching in October. But as you guys know, I am doing these batch hand review sessions here on YouTube, and I'm bringing you a little bit of the content, a sneak peek, if you will. And today's session was very typical of the dark side of the game, the sort of silent, tedious, boring monotonous slog that is just winning a stack early and then just having to fold in spot after spot after spot. The situations that came up today, I deemed very few of them worthy of investment. A lot of times I was just like, okay, this card is really bad for my range in my hand. I have to check fold here. I could bluff here, but I don't like it. I think it's underfolded, so I'm not going to bluff. Oh, I missed another flop. Check fold, check fold, bet flop and check fold turn. It was a lot of stuff like this, but having the resilience to survive that and go through back-to-back -back sessions of this nature is part and parcel of being a strong poker player. If you want to be a professional poker player one day, this is something you've got to do. You've got to wake up on a Monday morning, start your grind, and then on the Friday evening of that week, you might be down 14 buy-ins and you've just suffered the whole time with very little fun stuff even happening. This is poker. This is reality. But you've got to train yourself to be that decision-making robot, to be that player that takes pride and joy in the analysis and in the objectivity of good play even when the results are not rewarding your efforts. We're going to go through 30 hands today that I played with this sort of variance going on, the kind of losing red line, the losing green line, folding a lot. And I'm going to show you how to stay disciplined amidst these. And I'm going to show you how to stay disciplined in these grueling sessions. This is reality. You guys need to adopt this skill. So let's start reviewing. I'm going to try and get through a hand about every 30, 40 seconds, something like that. So hopefully we'll get through all of these hands in good time. So let's go. Let us begin. Pocket tens here. In the cutoff, we go for a three bet against the under the gun player. I keep these really small because we're three betting a wide linear range and blah, blah, blah. And we don't have a ton of thick value bets. We do have some, but we have a lot of really thin isolation raises. We have three players stacked. Makes sense to go small. Villain checks the flop and we decide to check back. This was a known recreational player, as many people in this pool are. This is quite a soft game. And so when this player checks to me on the flop here, I could bet. But the thing is, I'm going to face random raises with two pair plus more than I am in equilibrium on a wet board like this against a recreational player against the fish. And so I don't really want to invite that with tens. I've got a lot of equity to realize here. I'm very unlikely to get many folds from better hands. While it's okay to bet here in equilibrium, I just don't want to start the bluff train quite yet. I want to get a bit more transparency here. I decide to check. I do turn a straight. Villain leads third pot. Really mandatory raise whenever your opponent's putting hardly any money in the pot and they have a mergy range with multiple draws and two pair and sets and just hands with equity against you. You want to raise your nutted stuff. If Ellen has ace 10, your job here is not to minimize the losses. That's just going to be really bad for you anyway. So we do decide to pump it up a bit here. The river bricks out in a very nice manner. Three of hearts, the ideal card. 
we go for the jam but sadly don't get paid off this time. Hand number two, nine eight of spades here in the big blind. We call. We could also three bet here. It's not, not the end of the world to three bet. We decide to check call the flop, which is standard. The seven comes on the turn. Really good card for a range. Would expect Phelan to check back quite a lot here. I think on the King River, you don't really get to do a lot of betting here with a hand like this. You're just going to be checking because your normal block bet that you'd be making with second pair is no longer available to you because your equity has just gone down. Your hand is now in what we call tier four. Tier four in the carrot poker school means that you have enough equity to show down. You've got somewhere between, I don't know, like 20 and 60% equity, usually just something mediocre, but you don't really want to be betting for any purpose. So we do check. When you face bet, check, bet from an unknown player, you typically want to call. I'm not going to go into like loads of the secrets about exactly where this is. There are exceptions in lots of spots. Grady is going to go over this fully. It's going to show you mass data reports on this, but late position, that's a little clue for you. When it's late position, bet, check, bet. There are exceptions, but most spots are going to be winning calls. So we do decide to make this one, needing to win about 25% of the time. Therefore, we can handle losing. King 3 is obviously not an open on the button. Villa is indeed a recreational player, but you know, if it's a player that's doing shit like this, then probably calling River is fine. Remember, you don't need to win very often with these plays, and it is quite easy to overbluff for Villain, i.e. to bluff more than 25% of the time in this spot. So pretty confident that's a winning call. H-Jack off, we go for the 3-bet here. Button calls, we see bit the flop. The turn is a deuce. Now, this is kind of grim. You can check fold here if villain bets big. That's okay. You can also consider jamming here. It's not like a bad play either at this SBR. I actually thought the villain had a bit more money than this in game for some reason. I'm not sure why. Don't know if I misread the stack size. I decided to do this. The idea here is, well, it's going to be really annoying if I get jammed on but I'm actually hoping that this prevents my opponent from making a bet that they may make if I was to check here. So it's very possible that they have a hand like King-10, King-Jack, something like this. This is a side benefit of betting, by the way, not the main reason. And perhaps they would have just jammed against a check, but they call against this, which is kind of nice. But the main reason for this bet is just that villain can still have a five or a gut shot or pocket nines or pocket tens or pocket eights or something like that. Or perhaps some really weird floaty hand like the ace four of spades. Okay, that won't full turn because the flush drop it. Ace four of hearts, let's say. And this really cheap price is likely to fold loads of those hands out. And hopefully villain won't be elastic enough. Here we do get jammed on, which kind of sucks. But yeah, I think you can go a number of different ways on that turn. I think it's quite close. But I think usually taking advantage of these smaller bet sizes here that achieve a similar thing as a big bet would in this spot, that's a pretty good idea. So I prefer this to jam, I think. But the downside is that we don't realize our four outs if we do get jammed on. Unfortunately, we have to fold. Queen 10, open the button, get 3-bet tiny, indication that this is a bad player. I wouldn't normally flat this hand to a 3-bet, but here I do, because clearly there's going to be some skill edge. I'm getting great pot odds. The 3-bet's ridiculously small, so I think a winning call. Half pot and flop. Again, if you raise here, the problem is that people are just jamming over pairs on flush draw boards a lot in these games, so you don't really want to invite that. This is a pure call. I think call is easily better than raising here. And on the turn, this is close. In GTO, I think you can jam here and you can also just call here. In reality, I just decided that people who are recreational, who are making it six pre-flop and stuff like that, I think they're more likely just to pay off lightly here than they are to actually triple barrel bluff the river. I do block some of the bluffing range here with the queen and the 10 as well. I block the case 10 and ace queen, making it a bit more likely my opponent has aces or ace king or jacks or king jack or something like that. So I decided to shove here for value. I think this is probably the best play, just against a range that's quite mergy and has probably just got a lot of pair plus draw, a lot of like over pair, set to pair, stuff like this in it. Not that many bluffs, and if they do have bluffs, I just don't think it's super likely they'll be bluffing River at a high frequency, given the player profile so far. We do get the fold that time, which is unfortunate, but when it's not your day, it's not your day. Pocket Kings, open hijack. Three bet by cutoff, we four bet get it in here we win against queens this is the one hand we win it's the downhill road from here my friends king deuce in the small blind here we open you can bet or check the flop when called by big blind it doesn't matter bet call king turn go for a check here you can mix this one up it doesn't actually matter what you do you can do a bit of slow playing out of position you can also just continue to fast play if i did fast play here i would just bet 75 percent pot usually on this card because it's not as big a nut advantage as there would be on some brick turn like a nine and fill and checks back on the river, villain's range is obviously getting pretty depolarized now, showdown value heavy, mergy, expecting people to sort of wait until river and then find the bluff in this pool. It's not a great ploy. Two things can happen here that thwart that ploy. One is just that people auto bet their bluffs when checked to other turn too much, and the other is that you get some really bad players here that show down like 
eight seven or something that don't even realize that you have to bluff that hand so i'm just gonna value bet river you could probably over bet here as well i don't mind an over bet i don't think people will slow play enough king x on the turn but on this straight completing river that completes like ace deuce and stuff like that i just opted to go for this sizing which i think is probably best we are called by jacks that didn't three bet pre as i say soft pull honestly while i lost like two buy-ins or something today in this session my opponents played notably terribly like, I really did note so many blunders going on for my opponents here. I think I played quite well, even though it was a, a frustrating session. Queen Jack 7. And in fact, I wasn't even frustrated. I quite enjoyed it because I was just in the zone to make good decisions. But yeah, certainly a session that can frustrate you if you're not careful. You want to avoid that. We call the flop C bet here with Ace Queen off. Villain bets the turn and we call again. Jam turn is not totally out of the question. I think it's kind of reasonable. There are some pair plus draw hands such as Ace King. That may feel they have to call off here that hand may also fold it's also like ace jack at the same time though we are losing to a bunch of hands the goal here is not really to allow ourselves to get away from this on many runouts like we're not trying to save a stack against king 10 here that's going to be really ambitious rather what we're doing by calling is leaving the big blind bluffing range in here which is usually stuff like 10 9 suited 10 8 suited king 5 suited king 8 suited stuff like this and allowing it to barrel the river and allow villain to bluff instead of just blowing those hands out when you're in position, you have absolute control of the pot. And if Ellen does check, you can just jam the rest anyway. Here I went a little bit smaller. You could definitely jam this node, but I feel this is going to be super overfolded if we jam. It's going to be overfolded anyway, but I felt the sizing was maybe a touch better with our hand here. I don't know. I could be convinced that we could go bigger, but I don't really think it matters much. We get the fold this time. That's normal. When people bet twice there, they end up folding a lot on the river after checking because they would just follow through for value most of the time. Makes sense. Villain showed a jack here, which could mean that he found a kind of nifty turn barrel with the jack 10 suited or something in this spot, which is a good bluff that many people don't find. Or it could just be that he was like some rando fish that just bet second pair, third pair twice, not knowing what they were doing. But in any case, that was not a hand they were going to call river with. Jack 10 here, I flatted because the stack size is super awkward. Against a 3x open in particular, there's not really a 3-bet size I want to use here. If they opened men, I would go like 7 pretty happily, or 8. Here I'd have to go like 10 or 9 or something. Nah, I don't love it. I mean, you could go 9, but 3-bet fold is a really grim line here. Like, you're going to face jam too often. I think that call is the play. Or maybe fold, but I think call is a bit better. Could lead this flop. We decide to check. And I think this will be a really winning turn bluff on this texture. Our range is doing really well. We can bet quite unselectively. In GTO terms, we unblock hearts and clubs, which are more likely checkbacks on the flop than spades, so we actually like this suit, but that's really besides the point. I think the main point here is that Villain will be really underprotected. Does call the turn. The king is quite bad for our range. We do block some combos of like king 10, king jack, but I don't think those are calling turns, so we don't really block anything good here. Jacks and 10s are usually betting flop. I think we're just really blocking like ace jack ace 10 which are hands we probably want to fold and on this card on this node i felt like my fold equity was pretty limited for one reason when you're against a recreational player they'll fit into one of two camps usually somebody sticky and stationary that doesn't believe you or somebody who is just like playing meekly and the meek player is just going to have a good hand for calling turn most of the time and the other guy is probably going to be pretty sticky on the river so when your turn bet doesn't work here this is not a great node to follow through on the river so it goes check check and we lose to ace queen not a great bluff spot by any means, I don't think. 4-bet here with queens. The board comes king 10 8 Not so good, but definitely a great board for a range. We're going to start off here with a check, though, against this recreational player. Again, you can just sort of work out who people are by what they do pre-flop. 850, not really a reggae sizing. I think I also just had a bit of data that the player was playing limps and a wide VPIP PFR gap and stuff like that. So I opted to just check the flop and really just ask them, hey, what you got? What you doing? Like, what's going on here? The turn was a nine of diamonds, so really bad board for me. I think just checking again, realizing equity here, and never getting jammed on. Value betting the river if we really want to is a good idea. The jack of diamonds came on the river. Villain checked pretty quickly. There could be a few combos of flushes in range here, but not very many at all. Like, how does Villain really have a queen? I guess he can have, like, ace queen off with the queen of diamonds, but I think that's going to bet river with the straight flush. I think the ace of diamonds is going to bet river. They'd have to have, like, a set of eights with a diamond or sevens with a diamond to have a flush here. So I figured there were way more combos of like two pair and sets and stuff in villain's range. So I got really greedy here and just went for this like super thin value bet. But I think it's fine. We did run into the sevens with a diamond unfortunately. But if we sometimes get called by other stuff then that's okay. I maybe could have gone a bit smaller with this and just gone like quarter pot or something instead of third. 
Queen Jack of Spades here in the big blind. Go for a squeeze this time. Go three way. Make a tiny C bet. Going to be playing a lot of tiny C bet on this board. Billing calls. I mean, this is what I'm talking about, guys. There's not really anything else to do on this turn, but check fold. You just have to take your medicine there. Move on to the next hand. Your opponent's already filtered. Your hand is kind of dog shit. You don't really want to bluff catch that spot. You can't value bet that spot. You can't bluff that spot. You just check and hope you get the showdown against jack 10 and win or against nines and win or something like that. But usually you just lose there from the turn onwards. Ace 8 of clubs opening hijack. Get called by small blind. King 10, 7. Really good board for range. Going to go ahead and... You can play a range bet small bet strategy or you can like use a big bet strategy here which is fine too go for the big bet this time villain calls leads the turn i mean you can definitely raise here you can also call if you raise here you're kind of saying i have a 10 or i have a good king i think villain's range here is going to be mostly king x there might be a little bit of 10x then there's going to be a ton of different draws like jack nine queen nine eight nine stuff like this in there as well there might even be the odd mergy hand like ace queen or seven x or something as well so i think raising would be okay there Against the pot size river bet, this is just generally really bad news. This tiny bet, pot size bet line from a recreational player who flatted out the small blind. Definitely a spot you don't really want to bluff catch in against that exact sizing. The cool thing about grade E is it breaks down the recreational player's bet sizing patterns and shows you which sizes they're bluffing the most with and the least with compared to the GTO bluff frequency. So you actually see this across the board in loads and loads of different spots, different positions, 3-bet pots, 4-bet pots, 2-bet pots, all kinds of different stuff. Maybe not 4-bet pots actually for recreational players, but the other two for sure. So we study that a lot in grade A and you can see some really illuminating things in that course. 10-4 of hearts. Go for the 3-bet bluff this time. This is totally fine. I don't mind this against the recreational because while they might be a bit stationary sometimes against 3-bets, or some of them will be, they'll also not 4-bet bluff you. They won't 4-bet bluff you enough at all. And you're going to reap back a lot of the EV you maybe lose by experiencing a bit less fold equity from the fact that you don't get 4-bet enough. 10-8-7, we check back on the flop. I think you can bet here, you can check here, it doesn't really matter. Bill and bet's turn. Not a happy spot, but at 5-1, to one, at 4-1, to one, sorry, I think we definitely want to call. And on the river, I think this is a bit too thin. I mean, 6-X could easily play this way. Jack-X could play this way, freaking out about the river pairing. I think this is just a check back. Not much else to say. We went against A7. A7 leading turn. I mean, it's not so clear what villain is really doing there. Is that a value bet? It seems dicey. Is that a bluff? I don't really know. It might not be horrible with that much equity. Maybe it like borderlines on value and it gets a little bit of denial by stopping us binking a random king that's not a diamond and winning river or something with some of our range. But overall, the turn bet's a little bit weird. Don't bet the turn just because you have a pair in a draw. That might be the middle of your range. You might want to just check it. It might be a polarization mistake. Pocket queens, we open under the gun, and this happens. Easy jam. Isolating this player, trying to get this player out of the pot. We run into the pocket kings and lose. That one's pretty boring. 7 6 of diamonds now in cutoff. Decide to flat this 3 bet. You can fold to this as well. Super break even situation. Villain's 3 bet here is a bit bigger, indicating that they're probably a regular. A quarter pot flop, which is another kind of reggy thing to do. I actually opt to raise here. You can call or raise the spot, but my theory is just basically that, well, it's not even really a theory. This is also included in Grady, a big segment on how to play this kind of strategy and why you should do it and how people are reacting data-wise. But the idea here is that this is really unfamiliar. It's kind of uncharted waters for villain and people are likely to make a lot more mistakes in unfamiliar landscapes. So when they're betting small here, they're not used to facing too many races from in position and the way they have to defend is definitely taxing and it's going to put them out of their comfort zone. So the raise makes sense from us, by the way, because we can fold out better. We can get called and still have quite a lot of equity against many parts of villain's range. And all of the fold equity we get is highly useful because we're pretty much always folding out two overcards here, right? Well, we are always folding out two overcards here when villain folds. So that's definitely a good spot to hybrid raise the flop. No problem with that. Hybrid is a fancy term from grade 3 of the Carrot Poker School. You don't have to worry about it. But it basically means that there's multiple reasons for raising all at the same time. Check back on the turn. Eight of hearts on the river. The spot's kind of weird. I really don't feel like reigniting here. I think there's no showdown value, let's face it. But at the same time, I just didn't rate my fold equity on the raise check check bet node. I feel like this is a node where people are a little suspicious. I don't know. I don't know just how good this turn is for our range. I mean... I don't think I'm raising that many of my mediocre flush draws, like my Jack-10, King-Jack, Queen-Jack, King-Queen. I don't think I want to like reopen raise those on an ace high board that often. So I figured this card wasn't actually like as good for my range as flush cards are normally for flop raisers and single raise pots, so I just opted to check here. There are some times you can bet like really, really wide. 
Maybe I should keep bluffing here, actually. Yeah, because my hand is kind of terrible, but it does have some redraw against Ace X. Even Ace X with the spade, it has a bunch of redraw. I should probably bet here. Yeah, this is probably a bluff I'm missing. Like, if I'm not bluffing this, what the hell are my bluffs? I don't have any offsuit stuff. This must just be like a pure bluff or really high frequency bluff. Missed the trick here, guys. A bit sloppy from me. River, I think, is a check, though. And it was good that we made that mistake in one sense. Well, it wasn't. It's never good that you make a mistake, but here it did save us some money against top set. Ace, queen of spades. Open cutoff, big blind calls, ace jack nine, two to and we go for the large bet. Again, just building the large bet strategy. People are less familiar with it. It's fun. I like building it. You can also play small bets here, of course, and just bet your whole range. Turn, you can bet or check. It doesn't really matter. I go for a bet this time. Billing calls, and he bomb leads the river. I mean, like, what do you expect me to do here, man? I'm not fucking calling you with ace queen of spades. Like, I'm not paying you off with any bluff catcher here. This is just ridiculous. There's no air in villain's range whatsoever after the turn call. My range is more polar than theirs is, yet they want to stop me bluffing and just, like, just check raise if you have the nuts. Like, I'm going to bluff a lot. I'm going to value bet my sets and flushes anyway and my straights. Just check raise if you have the nuts. What are you doing? This is horrendous. Seriously, seriously bad poker. Okay, King Jack of Diamonds here. That guy doesn't deserve to play the game, needless to say, guys, right? Get cold called here by small blind. Go for 60% pot. I think that's fine. Kind of value denial bet. Not really any problem with this. Bill and calls. Awful turn. I think this is mediocre now. I don't see how we can keep value betting, particularly against the cold call range, which is going to have quite a lot of queens in it. Villain could have 10s as well. If I can value bet against that on the river if I really want to, if I think that we have enough equity. The river, four flushes. The guy has, like, very little layer here. I guess they can have, like, the King, Queen of Spades and Clubs, but we block the King, Queen of Diamonds. This feels extremely underbluffed, like we're just going to run into, like, Ace of Hearts or possibly something like King, Queen of Hearts and stuff in this spot. They don't have a lot of value hands here, but they have even less bluffs by quite some distance, so I don't think we can call here, especially with the King of Diamonds in our hand. It's somewhat interesting, though. Because there are so few value combos, it's not that difficult to overbluff. But the minute villain starts flatting ace king off here pre and then calling flop with it, maybe it doesn't call flop with that actually, but maybe it does with a heart. Yeah, ace king with a heart probably does call flop a lot of the time. Yeah, I think there's enough value combos here as long as that's going on. Kind of weird spot. These are small range spots, right? Where neither the value region or the bluff region is very abundant. But that's not the point. So you don't want to just be like, oh, he has hardly any value hands, so I call. Because he also has hardly any bluffs, so you need to like weigh the two up, compare and contrast. A7 go for the three bet, get called, and we go check check here. Turn seems like a pretty easy check. River, we just simply check down in this situation. Value betting river feels a little bit thin, I would say here. We run into absolute air. I mean, this is the thing, like villain's range here on 10 7 6 is not doing badly at all on the flop. When the nine comes on the turn after I've checked back, his range is doing really, really well. So not leading either turn or river here is pretty damn criminal with 5-4. But as I say, I just saw so many mistakes today from my opponents. This is just such a bad play. You just cannot check down in a spot that's really good for you like that when you have 5 high. You just don't want to do that. You can give up with 5 high in many situations, but not ones that are really good for your range, guys. That's the whole point. That's the whole river blunder theorem thing from the carrot poker school. Open 10s here, 10, 9, 8, 7. I believe that's a straight draw and a pair. You want to bet the flop a lot here. We do go for a bet. King turn, I think you can bet 75% pot or a check. We bet 75% pot. Easy check down on the river. Lose to king 10. Not much to say, just more of the same variance. Sixes open small blind, get called by button. Big bet here. This looks like a polarization mistake, but it's not. Villain has to continue a bunch of two over cards here. And if they don't, they're going to be really overfolding and we're going to clean up a lot of equity. Very good board for range, very good nut advantage spot for our range, that increases our sizing. Sixes is cuspy, but it can still do this, there's no problem with this bet. After that though, our value has run out, we just want to try and get to showdown, win against like ace queen high or something. Once in a blue moon, sometimes be able to bink the six on the river. Villain does check, river is too thin for value, villain bets here. I think people have a hard time bluffing in this way on this node, check back turn bet river here. They can have Queen Jack. Okay, that's not it, because they can also have like King Jack of Spades, King Queen of Clubs, stuff like this. Okay, even King Queen Off is meant to like call the flop here. Or King Queen of Hearts is meant to call the flop here. I think the problem is that people overfold on the flop. So the reason I just decided not to bluff catch this river, I think this would be like a roll kind of thing, an RNG thing in equilibrium where you'd call sometimes and fold sometimes. But the reason I elected not to is just that I don't think people are really calling the flop often enough to get here with enough bluffs. 
I think flop is overfolded, which is good for me and good for my flop bet, and therefore I decided to fold river, so just using a little exploit there. 3 bet here from button we call queen jack. I don't like stabbing zero equity in boards that are horrible for our range, that would just be a blunder. And on the river I go for like a really tiny block bet here. Villain can have kings and queens so we're going to lose a bet to that. We are also going to run into like 8s and 10s sometimes as well though, or jack 10 or something like that. So I think this is really close between like a tiny block and a check, I think either one is okay. Villain had kings. Ace-5 off, we peel the min open here though this is really close. Check, check, go for the big bet here. You can go for over bet here if you really want to. They're meant to protect the checking range with some flushes, which stops the solver wanting to use many over bets here, but you can, and in reality, maybe you even should. After villain calls, I think we have a pure bluff here. The 8 completes a lot of our other bluffs. Our 10 8 is no longer air. Our jack 10 gets there. Our jack 8 hits a pair. I think we're just always bluffing this hand. You could go like 4x pot here. You could probably go all in here, actually. That's definitely a play that's allowed. We do go for like the overbet here and we get called by ace queen. The weird thing about ace queen is I don't think it's a particularly great bluff catcher. Like it's okay, but it doesn't block any of our value region. The fact that this is far up villain's range in an absolute hierarchy sense doesn't mean anything. But this guy like snap called me on the river with ace queen, so I was pretty sure that he didn't understand the fact that my value region completely smoked ace queen and that he had a bluff catcher. I'm pretty sure he was just like, oh, well, I have top pair top kicker on the flop, so I'm not going to fold now that I checked back for whatever reason. Because this is the logic, right? People are not very good at recalibrating these fortune reversal spots and realizing when they have bluff catchers. Does that mean we shouldn't bluff the river? No, because villain has a ton of ace nine and pocket sixes and stuff like king jack one diamond that's just clearly going to fold. So... Obviously we beat that, but if we check it bluffs us, and yeah, we still want to bet. So yeah, this is a, a very well played hand by us, I would say. A bit unlucky there. Splash pot. I mean, attacking here is kind of outrageous. No one is going to believe that your big blind check range here is not over bluffing if they have half a brain. So you should get called by like really any piece of this here. And with three opponents, I don't think there's a bet size that works here. The problem with splash pots is it puts people into like this frenzied fight mode where they feel like they have to compete. If you play on sites like this, you'll know what I'm talking about. How are we doing for time here? Not great. Let's speed this up a little bit. Pocket potatoes. Go for the cold four bet. The worst hand I'm cold four betting. Not a big fan of this. You could even fold here. This is super touch and go like borderline. But yeah, it's fine. And then we go for like the tiny flop bet, which is normal. We check the turn. This spot is super grim. This guy was running like a really, really tight V-pip. And this sizing here is also just stupidly big and, and pointless. It doesn't shouldn't be this big. So I think this is a recreational player. When they call flop and then bet turn here, I think we're just toast. I think we're doing really badly. I don't think there's going to be enough of like the floaty hands calling to bet turn and stuff like that. So call can't be too terrible. I think jam is awful. Fold is, is probably best. Ace nine, go for the open on the button. Six, six, seven. When have you seen me fold so much, guys? Have you ever seen me fold this much in a video before? By the way, one quick announcement. If anyone rocks up to the comment section here and says, sincerely says, Oh, you're playing weak passive, mate. Uh, yeah, you're playing too weak passive, innit? Do you understand that when you're dealt hands where check fold is the right play, you shouldn't just start betting because you check folded a few times previously? Do you understand that? Evidently fucking not. Get the hell out of here. I'm going to ban these people from the channel if they do this. I'm not having it. I'm not having it, guys. Man. That was a rant. That felt good. <laughs> Nine of spades. All right. So we, we made something good. Now we can value raise. So we do that. River's a three. I think we've still got value here. This, this weird little turn probe, by the way, from this pool is just going to be all sorts of shit. You name it. They've got it. So I think you just want to raise here on double flush draw with the best nine possible. They call, and with the three river, easy value bet, you don't want to miss this one. But no dice. Jack eight, splash pot, decide to make a really light limp here. I don't think people are really playing very well in this pool, so I decided at like a billion to one we could maybe creep in with jack eight off. Don't know what you think about this. Take off your pants and jack eight. We decide to take a stab here at this three-handed, four-handed splash pot. Very often we are just going to get no resistance because if someone has no ace or no king, they're likely folding, and very often people don't have an ace or a king after this preflop action sequence, so going for the bet here is okay. We do get called. I decide to bet the turn. There's a lot of, like, king rag and stuff like this in villain's range. There might be, like, a three. There might be an under pair. 
the spet's okay. We have the ability to hit the river and win a massive pot. Obviously, I don't mind this. We get called. Now I opt to give up because villain is a fish in a splash pot that's just called a turn on a triple Broadway run out. So I feel like my fold equity on the river here is limited. I could jam. Jam would be the sizing here if I bet. That's my, my only size, but decided to give this one up. I run into king seven. The guy that calls king seven on this turn, I don't love my fold equity on the river against this kind of person. And this is the whole argument of the people with the wide range are often just stationing all the way in the splash pot and the people with the tighter range are often folding, you know, flop or if they do call turn, they have a stronger hand. So I don't think this is a great triple spot in this pool, in this environment, in a splash pot. Obviously it's fine in GTO, but I don't think it's good in this environment. This is open button called by small blind, called by big blind. Bottom set here, go for the large c-bet which is fine, get called, go for the overbet on the purest, cleanest, most overbetty turn. You'll note that I size this down a little bit. Normally I go B150. The reason I sized it down is just because it was multi-way, the SPR is such that I don't really have to do that. Fill and folded. Ace King, go for a three bet here, 10 six disc, go for large bets in this texture, get called, giving up turn for sure. Not much to do, just a crappy, awful card for my range. This is gonna be a check fold, nothing else to say. And pocket Kings. Three more hands to go. Kings, ace, king, and kings. Get three bet, four bet, get called, 10, nine, seven. Check, check, what a turn. Great turn for my range. We can definitely thin value bet here if we keep it really small. With kings here, you're getting called by queens, you're getting called by jacks, you're getting called by eights. Like there's definitely some value to be had here. If you check, no one is really gonna bluff you ever. So continuing by check calling here really sucks. You could just check fold here. I think that's reasonable. You can also bet small, don't mind. Now eights gets there and jacks gets there. <laughs> the only bluff is queens. He has to like bluff queens pure here before I even become indifferent. That's not happening in this pool. Easy, easy fold. Never call river in spots where like literally everything got there. You're going to do very, very badly indeed. Ace king. We go for the three bet. We get called. We check. It checks through. King on the turn. We decide to make the B120 here. Our range is really strong for betting this card. I have two sizes here gonna have like a smaller sizing for my tens or whatever that wants to bet sometimes for value and also a bigger sizing for the ace king king queen kind of region and this time i decided to put this hand into this sizing bill and called 10 rivers not ideal tens gets there 10 nine suited gets there if that exists it might king 10 gets there as well that said an spr of less than one there's still a ton of hands that have to bluff catch here like king queen king jack queen's jacks at some frequency jack 10 decide to jam Pick up the fold, villain showed queens here. Makes some sense. I mean, he's, he's definitely blocking some bluffs. I think the queen of clubs is a good thing for calling because I think my queen of clubs X is more likely to give up river, whereas my ace queen of diamonds or offsuit with no club is more likely to follow through, unblocking the, the club club in villain's range. So I think this is the combo to call with if you're going to call queens, but I don't blame villain for folding. And finally, pocket aces. Sorry, it wasn't kings. It was kings, ace, king, aces. Open hijack, get called, 685, decide to check back here. This hand continues the theme of my opponent playing badly. I'm pretty sure I don't remember why, I just remember feeling like they played badly here. So this checking range is probably underprotected. The three of clubs turn, I think you can check back again here in GTO. I'd never really bother with it against a small blind caller in this pool because they're just going to be a fish and they're going to have a really weak mergey capped range and you want to value bet twice against that. So that's exactly what we do in this really pure river. And villain calls with ace queen no club yeah this is a horrible call like you're blocking just about every bluff imaginable you're not really blocking any value bets i guess you're blocking like aces and queens but yeah this is this is not the hand to call with in theory and i don't think it's good in practice either i mean maybe against someone that just isn't capable of checking back and overpair on the flop you can make that call but yeah it doesn't seem great hope you enjoyed today's video let me know what you think sometimes your job and the dark side of poker is just to play your way through sessions like this. It happens a lot. And the better you get at this, the better that graph is going to look in the long, long term. The better you're going to do compared to your competitors. Definitely look to keep it together to work on your willpower. And make sessions like this a routine thing that you get through professionally. Putting your best foot forward. All right. More content coming very soon here on Carrot Corner Poker Education. Do hit that subscribe button. Let's get up to 10k. See you next time.